Our special guest is Tony Limbo. He's the author of the new book, The Hopeville Fire Department, a boy's story of betrayal by one of New England's most notorious priests. And it's one of the few priest victim stories that you're going to actually hear about. During the course of the uh, the program today, Tony is going to go into detail on what happened. The settlement, Tony, first of all, welcome to This Week in America. It's a uh, shocking story, and you're to be c congratulated for writing the book and actually trying to help other people that are in similar circumstances or prevent them from getting into similar circumstances. Well, thank you very much, and uh, it's been a hard, hard effort to make, but it's definitely worth it. Let's take something that was in the news just a while back, and that was the settlement with the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. $660 million, I think the largest settlement so far, divided by over 500 people, came with an apology. Just as an outsider looking at that, uh, it seems like that's a lot of money. But explain what the money means and the fact that many people, victims say, that just doesn't make it go away. It doesn't make it right. And then tell me what the apology means. First of all, with the money, what does that mean? Because you had a settlement with the Archdiocese of Boston. What does that settlement mean to you? Does that ease the pain in any way? No, no, it really doesn't. Uh, I can only speak for myself, but I think that most of the survivors feel the same way. And, uh, uh, you know, getting into the civil uh court uh, with this pedophile priest uh, was never about money. It was about stopping this priest from continuing to do harm to children. Uh, and the way I felt about it was to, uh, once, I, once I got the money, um, I spent a sig significant portion of it so that I could uh, exercise my freedom of speech and tell the country exactly what has been happening to uh, the survivors out there. And I know that's something that was very important to you. It's like if I get this money and I don't share this story and I don't help other people and I don't try to prevent this from happening, I'm really doing an injustice. I really need to make sure that I retain my right throughout this entire process to at the appropriate time go public and tell what happened to me. That's right. Uh, I, a federal judge mediator got involved with our case and uh, I, right from the onset I made it clear that you know I would the only way I would go, you know, through this arbitration was uh, if I was not forced to sign a non-disclosure agreement because I, I felt as though I could not uh, take money uh, from these people as a settlement if it was contingent on, on me being silent because I think that it was all the silence for many, many years uh, is the reason why, you know, there's been over 10,000 people who have you know, come forward. Well, when you look at your cir circumstances, and not a whole lot different than others I've read about, Father Foley, in this particular case, the priest, and we'll set the, exactly what happened in just a few seconds, but Foley, back in 1967, in the seminary, accusations first came up about the fact that there were, there were some sexual issues back then, and in many cases, you read it, and it happened in Boston, where a priest would be accused of sexual misconduct in, in one diocese, and would be shifted off to another. Was the church really lacking in the early stages, taking this pro problem very seriously? Uh, I think that they were. Uh, I don't understand it. Uh, it really hurt me deeply, uh, you know, being raised Catholic and believing in the Church. When I found out all the facts that had happened surrounding what happened to me, it, it, it really bothered me, you know, that in 1967, nine years prior to uh, what happened to me, that they actually knew that this guy was doing it. And then it absolutely blew me away to you know, when I found out that uh, a couple of years before this happened with me, they gave this man, you know, the position of state police and fire chaplain for the state of Connecticut, which is a very coveted position and one which has an even higher amount of trust bestowed on them. Uh, I, I, for the life of me, I cannot figure out why they did that. Yeah, when you talk about a magnet to attract young men, he is the state police fire chaplain. He drives around in a tricked-out car that looks like a police car. That's the title of the Hopeville Fire Department. Uh, he's a priest, so if you grow up Catholic, you've got this great reverence for the priest, so you not only are buddies with the priest, here's a guy that can take you out to fires, that can get you in parades on the back of a fire truck. It really is a magnet to attract young men, isn't it? Yes, it was, and, uh, you know, my story where I ran in and was and was sucked into this funnel where they came a hold of, of me and, and my friend was at the Easter Seals Day Camp in Wilka, Connecticut, where we volunteered for the summer and gave up our time to help the handicapped children. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, that was pretty low, pretty low to go to a place like an Easter Seals Day Camp to uh, suck young boys.
Yeah, basically do recruiting there. You're listening to This Week in America. Our guest on the program is Tony Lembo. He's the author of the book, The Hopeville Fire Department, A Boy's Story of Betrayal by one of New England's most notorious priests. Tony was involved in what basically is the epicenter of this national scandal, the Archdiocese of Boston. Tony's website is TonyLembo.com. Lembo is L-E-M-B-O. Our website is thisweekinamerica.us. You can go to our website and log on directly to Tony's, get information on the book, and get other information uh, that might be vital if you think you've been in a situation like this or you suspect something is happening. You're 14 years old. You get involved with this priest, and your father's a little skeptical, warned you early on, and he, that goes back basically to the amount of money your mother was putting in the collection basket. And he was never quite sure where that money was going, what it was paying for. But your mother, and, and so many families were like this, especially, especially devout Catholic families, you're with the priest, therefore everything is fine. And that was her attitude. Yes, it was. That was, that was her attitude, and, uh, you know, I'm not going to twist it on you. Uh, I, I went right to my mother when I had to get permission to go. They had already taken me and my friend down there and uh, had drove us around on the fire truck on the back step, and I was hooked. We never really had a lot of money when I was growing up, and I never really was able to join anything. This was free, and I found myself with my, you know, playing fireman on a fire truck and actually riding on it, and and I did go to my mother to ask permission because I knew that with the priest involved, she would let me go. When did you realize, you talk in the book somewhat early on in the relationship with the priest, and again, he would drive around in this this car, this tricked up uh, fire department-like car, usually would have a number of teenagers with him. Uh, you're 14 at the time. He said, once it's unusual to find a six-pack of beer, he was always entertaining the young people. And you talk about slapping that occurred early on, which basically was a form of crotch grabbing, and at that point you were like, I'm not real comfortable with this situation. Yeah, I wasn't comfortable with it, neither were my friends, but, you know, we tolerated it. It came in spurts, and uh, when we would finally, you know, lash out in, you know, in React, uh, which which we did, uh, they would they would temper the situation by rolling up the doors and bringing out the fire truck and taking us around and defusing the whole situation. After the initiation occurred, and this is where there was a somewhat intimate sexual relationship uh, at the time, you and your friend, uh, which you describe in, in detail in the book, the Hopeville Fire Department, and information on that at TonyLembo.com, our guest on This Week in America. After that happened, and this, this is fascinating because as you hear all of these stories, they talk about how this actually changed their lives, and they say that, but we really don't understand exactly how it changed it. In reading the book, we find out what happened to you. Basically, your whole attitude towards the church. I remember the, the story in the book where your mom is, is getting you up to go to church, and you don't want to church anymore. And you get into a really series of arguments with your parents, especially your mother, because she's buying this religion stuff. Your whole attitude totally changed towards the church. Yes, it really did. I mean, you also have to remember, at, at that age, you know, I wasn't thinking, you know, through the mind of, of a grown Adult, and you know, having a uh, brutal sexual attack uh, happen to me. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, this was the only priest that I ever actually knew in person, and he was the nicest priest that I ever knew in person until all of a sudden he got ugly. So, you know, the priests in the church are always nice, and to me, I just thought, you know. I'm sorry, my mother was wrong. She's been she's been going to church, and these people are not about God, and they're they're not about all the things that they say they are. Because I felt as though I knew who they really were, and I wanted no part of it. it you know, I couldn't be dragged into that church. Although I was, I quickly uh, was not you know having to go in there anymore because they literally had to drag me in there. You know, I was crawling in my skin when I sat in the pew during the sermons. I couldn't even look at them. It really put a strained relationship on the the relationship that you that you had tensions with the relationship with your parents. Also, you dropped out of school and joined the Marines, and you, you sort of insinuate at one point in the book that maybe the Marine Corps was a, a way for you to go away and, and hide and just try to put this behind you. Was, was that why you? I think you dropped out in the tenth grade to join the Marine Corps. Was was that why you did that? That's exactly why I did that. You know, uh, after they had dropped me off that that Sunday. Uh, my whole home life was shattered. Uh, my mother took on a whole other person to me. I resented all of her religious teachings. I resented everything that 
you know, she coveted about the Catholic Church. Uh, it drove a wedge between my mother and myself. I spent so much time, you know, fighting with my mother and running away from her trying to pull me in. I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't do any schoolwork. I couldn't do anything, and uh, and I did. At the Marines, the Marines, I went down, started hanging around down the Marine Corps office, and, uh, you know, I love the Marines. They, they saved my life, and I, I don't remember who the recruiter was, but I'm sure that he could tell that I was a troubled, not a troublemaker, but a troubled kid. And he went and talked to my parents and said when I turned 17 that they would be glad to take me. And uh, I was off to boot camp uh, seven days after my 17th birthday. You're listening to This Week in America. Our guest on the program is Tony Limbo, author of the Hopeville Fire Department, a boy's story of betrayal by one of New England's most notorious priests. Our website is thisweekinamerica.us. Tony's is TonyLembo.com, L-A-M-B-O. You can get all the information on the book, which is available on Amazon and all over, but you get information on the book at Tony's website. Also get information on, on other aspects of what Tony went through and is so willing now to go out publicly and to share so this doesn't happen to other people. During the, the time in the Marine Corps, you actually thought that Father Foley, and at, at that point you really did want to refer to him as Father Foley, just Foley, he lost that distinction. Of, of being a priest, of being a father in your mind, you actually thought Foley was was probably arrested and serving time at that time. You were led to believe that he really was going to be handed some justice. Yes, I really was. And uh, <clears throat> just in the nick of time, I had I had uh, uh, a friend who was with me in the beginning of the book who wasn't with me in the end of the book. Uh, he calmed me down when I came back uh, from uh, – Camp Lejeune, when I was going to uh, settle the score with these guys, after all those years, it was still burning hot with me. He talked me out of it, and uh, his uncle was a, a captain in the fire department, and he said it would be handled. He called me a month later, and he told me that it was handled, that uh, he wouldn't be hurting anyone anymore, and uh, all that. So, you know, I let it go and just tried to live with myself, and then, of course, I found out when the Boston deal broke that uh, he was, in fact, still a priest. Nothing had ever happened to him. He had been taken off as an active priest in 1995 amid allegations. All those years, he still continued on. And when I launched my book four months ago, they actually caught a picture of him coming out of the seminary, which got the whole state of Connecticut in an uproar. He was driving the same type of police cruiser with the lights in the whole nine yards. Unbelievable. Still still doing the same thing that he had been doing. And... Uh, they basically kicked him out. They, they didn't defrock him. They just said that he was leaving connect the uh, Archdiocese of Hartford, and they didn't care where he went. And a private detective friend of mine told me that uh, he's now in Colorado, which bothers me because no one in Colorado knows about him. And uh, also, I think it's just another form of them moving a priest from one place to another. Well, was he ever prosecuted for these crimes? No, he was never prosecuted for these crimes, but, you know, there's been 12 so far. Another one came out after I launched my book. Another one had filed, which brought the number up to 12. Uh, we haven't had any that were in recent enough time for the statute of limitations for criminal to prosecute him. Nonetheless, the church has been paying off millions and millions of dollars in settlements for this guy. Everyone knows that he was doing it, including a state police investigation on him by Connecticut in the early 80s. and in which uh, the Connecticut State Police fired him from being fire chaplain and police chaplain and said that uh, most of the allegations that were lodged were true. It's amazing. So what you're telling me is within a few months ago, this priest who was able to use, as you described, the candy of the firehouse, the police culture, to lure teenagers in, possibly hundreds, uh, their lives shattered, your lives shattered, in many cases turning into violent sexual initiations, he is still out there basically unpunished. He is unpunished, and as far as I'm concerned, all indications point that he's still active. And uh, the Catholic Church, for some reason, doesn't seem to want to get it. Uh, when you have incredibly sick people like this, they will not check themselves. They will continue on until someone finally steps in. I have no idea why they just let him leave the state and go to another state where he's not being monitored. Instead of taking him while they had control and power over him and checking him into one of their Catholic, uh, you know, sanitariums, the right. psychiatric wings. We've got about a minute left in the program, just rapidly running out of time. And and then on top of that, the church will usually issue an apology while at the same time, obviously, 
maybe not necessarily putting a, a finite end to the problem. When they issue an apology and you see him going to Colorado, probably not changing his behavior, how sincere is the apology to be in your eyes? The apology is not serious at all, and I'll tell you why. Because, it, you know, my, my deal was quick. It only took a little over two years before, because a, met, a federal judge was involved before the thing was settled. But during those two years, they fought very hard against us, very hard. And, you know, an apology at the end of that doesn't mean a thing, especially when they fight you all the way through. And a check really doesn't mean that much either, does it? No, it, that doesn't mean anything. I'm, I'm trying to make the best use I can out of the money that they gave me. And what I'm doing is I'm exercising my right as an American, and I'm making it possible for everyone in America to have a window to look into one of these cases and understand the type of betrayal that has happened to the survivors and the type of lives and suffering that we had to put up with. That's Tony Tony Limbo has been our guest. Unfortunately, I knew this time would go by all too quickly. Tony Limbo, who was a victim, an author now, the Hopeville Fire Department, a boy's story of betrayal by one of New England's most notorious priests. We're sort of putting a, a picture and a story to what we've heard about for a number of years with the, uh, the clergy uh, abuse problems all across the country. Tony's website is TonyLembo.com, L-E-M-B-O. Our website is ThisWeekInAmerica.us. You can go to our website and, and link on directly to Tony's and get some information. Tony, congratulations again on an excellent book, opening people's eyes to actually what's going on out there, and thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you very much, Rick. Back on This Week in America in a minute.